Now, in the 1960s, the irrepressible conflict view got a new powerful lease on life, um, starting with the writing of a uh, very important historian, Eugene Genovese, who died about a year ago or so. Um, Genovese's book, published in 1965, The Political Economy of Slavery, um, re revamped the irrepressible conflict view, I think, in a, in a way that was very persuasive to a lot of historians. Genovese's argument, you might almost say, took the, the Beardian and the Schlesinger and others and put them together. The South was different. It was a distinct society. Slave labor creates a distinct society, different from that of the North, and on the basis of that society emerges an entire worldview based on slavery, an ideology. Genovese introduces the notion of ideology into this discussion, a very fruitful, uh, you know, very fruitful intervention. Ideology brings together all these things. It combines material interest, moral outlook, political advantage. Um, it's a vision of what society ought to be, what the, what the good society should be. And a pro-slavery ideology, worldview, comes to dominate the South. The, and so what is, this, what is the Southern secession? It's a fight for a way of life, a distinct way of life based on the institution of slavery. Now, Genovese doesn't use this to denounce them. In fact, he rather admires many aspects of the Southern planter class. But the point is, he's saying this was a fight for their lives. It was not just about the tariff. It was not just about honor, emotion. It was rational. It was real. This, they thought their entire society was at risk. Now, to go to a little personal reminiscence, I was very stimulated, or I was a graduate student this time. I was very um, influenced by Genovese, as many of us. And I basically decided I'm going to write my dissertation as the northern equivalent of Genovese. I'm going to look at the north from the same point of view, ideology. The, the ideology of the Republican Party before the Civil War. That's what my first book is about, the free soil, free labor, free men. I was going to call it, actually, the political economy of anti-slavery. That was my title, political economy of anti-slavery, because as a counterpoint to Genovese's political economy of slavery. Now, at that time, the American Historical Association, you sort of registered your title with them as a graduate student, sort of to claim that turf, you know? So I sent my postcard in with my title. I got back a note saying, well, someone else is already writing this dissertation. Someone has taken your title. So I was mortified. You know, this is the great fear of any graduate student. Someone is already writing their, graduate, their dissertation. So I went to my supervisor, Richard Hofstadter. I said, this guy McDermott is writing my dissertation. What do I do? Hofstadter, a brilliant man and a great man, said, forget about McDermott. That's what I say to any of you guys. Forget about McDermott. Go write what you want to write. McDermott probably won't even finish it anyway. <laughs> and he was right. I don't, I don't know what happened to McDermott. That book was never published. There's no book with that title. McDermott's probably selling insurance now. So I don't know. <laughs> but um, so anyway, um, uh, anyway, I, so I wrote the book. Anyway, but. Um, and then later on, just to continue along this vein, uh, uh, so this book is about the rise of the Republican Party and its ideology and how they put this new party together. We'll talk about this soon. Um, and it became, according to an interview, the favorite book of a major figure in American political life in the last 20 years. In an interview with New Yorker, he said, I was a history major in college. My favorite book was Eric Foner's Free Soil, Free Labor, Free Men, because it showed how you build a political coalition. This was Karl Rove. It was, yeah. You can Google it and see. Um, anyway, what, what I was, in, in conjunction with Genovese, I, I did the same thing. There was a, that the North, free labor, was a distinct society. And the, this, the ideology, that is, the, the concept of ideology enables you to merge these, all these different factors morality, interest, uh, politics, etc., into a picture of two different visions of the future of the United States at war with each other. 
uh, so to speak. Um, it's a new version of the irrepressible conflict. I mean, it was new then, it's not new anymore. Uh, uh, the irrepressible conflict interpretation. The Civil War is a conflict between two societies based on two fundamentally different labor systems which spawned two rival sectional ideologies. And for a good while, that remained the dominant point of view. Although I have to admit that this is partly because historians soon lost interest in the Civil War altogether. The rise of social history in the 1970s and 80s and cultural history soon after that um, led historians to refocus their interest away from grand events and main political leaders and things like that to the day-to-day -day experiences of ordinary people. People stopped studying national politics, et cetera, et cetera, or at least as the organizing theme for um, American history, et cetera. Uh, ironically, you might say, the central event in the lives of ordinary Americans of that generation was seen to be irrelevant uh, by a whole generation of historians. And local studies, that local social history studies began to proliferate that seemed to go back toward this revisionist view because when you study local communities, they don't seem all that different. You know, people in the North and the South were both farmers. They were both mostly concerned with making a living or whatever. They were both church-going people. So if you look at the very micro level, you're not going to see giant causes of the Civil War uh, 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 emerging. Um, or uh, Michael Holt, for example, a fine historian down at uh, Virginia, um, argued in several books that really at the local level, politics revolved not around these national issues like slavery, but around local conflicts, ethno-religious conflicts, Catholics versus Protestants, different Protestant sects against each other. Uh, issues like uh, the temperance, drinking, immigration. It wasn't the slavery issue that was galvanizing politics at the local level, and therefore we're coming back toward the blundering generation. National politicians are pushing people in a way they don't really want to go.